this week on CrossFeed. Can you pray in Washington, D.C.? What about at the zoo? But will you lose your inheritance? How will the economy affect you then? Do you really care? Hello, everyone, and welcome to CrossFeed Religious News. I am Pastor Dale Critchley, pastor of Shepherd of the Ridge Lutheran Church in North Ridgeville, Ohio. I'm Pastor Jim Butler at St. Luke's Lutheran Church in Dedham, Massachusetts. Welcome, everybody. Jim, I have to tell you, I'm so, I, actually, I've already told Jim about this, but I have to tell everybody else, I'm just so excited about this. Uh, we're working on our church website, and um, it's uh, shepherdoftheridge.org if you want to take a look at it. It's it, it's a work in progress. Um, we've kind of got the basic ideas mapped out, but um, it's just going to take a little bit of time to put all the pieces together. Uh, but uh, we were, you know, we were talking about well, what's our goal with this site? And we want to use it for a lot of different things. A place for um, to, uh, you know, in some private areas, we're going to have sort of documents and stuff like that um, that are uh, just as a sort of storage place. Um, so that there's no, no one person has all the important information. So if something would happen to that person or, or their computer or whatever, you know, that we've got backups, um, we want to have it for a place for the different groups within the church to, um, to be able to share information and, and plan things and, and stuff like that. But we said really our main goal for the main part of the site, that stuff's all sort of peripheral, um, is we want to use it in a way that will um that will bring Jesus to those who don't know him. And um and and so, you know, most church websites are sort of present, you know, here's this is our church and this is why we think you should come to our church and and all that kind of stuff and it it kind of comes across as an advertisement and and I mean to some degree we're going to have, you know, here's what's going on here and stuff like that. But right on our um who we are page, we have um after it says, uh, like, kind of what we're about and stuff like that, uh, then um, down at the bottom it says, we understand, uh, and I forget exactly how it's worded, um, but it's something to the effect of, we understand that we are not going to be able to meet the needs of everybody in our community. And so um, if we are not, we, we would love to have you here, but if if we cannot meet your needs, we would like to encourage you to attend one of these other churches instead. And then we've got a list of, of all the Missouri Synod churches within a five mile, six mile radius, something like that of us. And then there's a link to, it's actually a Google page because I couldn't find an actual local church directory. Um, but then we have a list of all, um, it, it, it just takes you to a page that has uh, links to all the various uh, Christian churches in the area. And, um, and I, I'm so excited about this because it, I, for one, I've never seen a church do this before. And, and just the idea of, you know, a lot of churches wouldn't do this because they go, well, that was, that's going to encourage people to not come here, you know, like, but, but our people are going, but yeah, that's the point is not to get people to come here. The point is not to build our kingdom. It's, it's all about the kingdom of God. And, you know, so I was just so excited and I'm just, I'm really just psyched about that, that the, whatever we can do to get the gospel out to people, um, you know, and yeah, we'd like to have them come here. We, you know, um, we'd like to have the opportunity to serve them and work with them and, you know, and stuff, but, um, and, but, you know, if, if they're not going to come here, then we still want to encourage them to, you know, to get, have Jesus be able to serve them, you know, through somewhere else instead. And so I just, I just thought that was really cool. We had a uh, Wisconsin Synod church in Rockford and we were looking at planning a new a church, not too far from where they were. And I mean, the church had been there for quite a while and I was really good friends with the pastor. And so I, I asked him, I said, uh, well, uh, Larry, uh, you know, we're looking at planning a church in your area that, you know, I mean, would it bother you? And he goes, uh, I don't have all the even. There's still plenty of them out there. <laughs> well, that was, I mean, I preached on that, I don't know, a few weeks ago. I, I said, 
you know, there's like um, 24,000, something like that, people just in North Ridgeville and, um, you know, not to mention all the other communities around here. And there's like, what, um, 15 churches or something like that. So I said, you know, unless we're all averaging well over a thousand people, you know, on any given Sunday, there's still, <laughs> there's still plenty of work for all of us, you know, to do, and we don't need to worry about competing. So. That's right. Our, our, our competition is a little bit south and a lot warmer place. Uh, so that's, that's what I'm more concerned about. Uh, so where should we start here tonight? Um, well, you know, since we're talking about competition, um, let's start out in Washington, D.C. All right. We've got a, a pair of stories that are, are kind of odd. Um, and, uh, and you, you kind of, they seem to be almost contradictory in just the way that, um, that it happens. And one of them is a um, Muslim Day of Unity uh, that was on uh, Friday the 25th. And they uh, assembled on uh, the capital grounds. Yeah, on the capital grounds. And just had a day of prayer. And so it's called uh, Juma prayer on Capitol Hill, a day of Islamic unity, which um, just refers to a, a Muslim uh, gathering uh, traditionally for Friday prayers. And um, so while they were having their um, uh, prayers and, and um, you know, just sort of assembly, uh, their gathering, um, there were some uh, groups like uh, Operation Save America as a um, Christian group that had two oversized tablets similar to the uh, sort of Ten Commandments things, and they're distributing pamphlets saying, abortion is murder, homosexuality is sin, Islam is a lie. I'm a little confused about that because most Muslims are believe that homosexuality is a sin too. So, like, yeah. Right, but that, that, one, I, that one I couldn't... Um, I mean, it wasn't that um, large of a group, but it was uh, 8,000 Muslims, which isn't really that many. Um, and uh, the sermon said that the sermon afterwards urged the Muslims uh, to say God bless America and uh, to avoid the trap of hating people, uh, which, you know, makes a lot of sense. Um, people don't realize it, but back before 9-11, um, George Bush uh, reached out for the Muslim vote. Mm -hmm. uh, they forget about that, that he, he hit... Uh, I, 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 and if you're talking civil righteousness, talking first use of the law, you know, uh, uh, that law that's written in people's heart. For a majority of modern day Muslims, there are those that follow Mohammed. You know, they are, you know, to a large extent, right where we are in a lot of those issues. Mm -hmm. uh, would be against homosexuality, would be against. Uh, 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 Abortion would be, you know, generally fairly, you know, right along where we are. I knew a, um, my, my, when I was, uh, my niece was at college, her roommate was Muslim, and I know her family, very nice people. You know, just like, you know, all the people using the Jewish doctors and dentists up here. Uh, you know, very nice people, you know, so... I really, I, you know, I, I don't like this, Islam is a lie, or there's another one, uh, uh, somebody else said, uh, uh, um, you know, they, oh, they, they, they called on them to unequivocally denounce specific terrorist attacks, um, you know, which, you know, but I, I, I uh, um, the guy said he, he, he didn't, uh, um, the, the head of this, Abdella, said he didn't see the letter, but he did say Muslims individually and collectively repudiate these acts. But I don't think tomorrow is the place for us to repudiate specific acts, which right. to me I would probably agree. I mean, uh, in my mind that might be, you know, okay, we're gonna, there's going to be a Christian gathering out there on the mall, and it's happened like uh, 1976 Washington for Jesus. Uh, you know, we want you all right now to specifically repudiate uh, you know, the killing of, of Dr. Tiller in, in Kansas. Well, 
there's none of us that's in favor of that, I guarantee you, but yeah, this is really the place to do that. Right, yeah. You know, and and that's the thing. I mean, I've talked to a um, uh, guy that works with uh, Pablo, people of the book Lutheran Outreach, uh, which is a specific outreach to Muslims. And uh, he said, you know, Muslim American Muslims, uh, presumably most Western Muslims, don't really like to talk um about all of the the terrorism stuff uh not because they're plotting anything but because they find the whole thing very embarrassing and they don't like to be associated with it they just you know don't want to have anything to do with it and uh you know and yeah it's it's like the people that go out and kill abortion doctors you know most christians you know an overwhelming majority you know except for a handful of freaks out there um are against it and they say that's horrible that's it's completely wrong you know you just got a handful of people that are you know that make the news and and you know we've we've talked about uh and it doesn't even have to be that extreme you got people like fred phelps that we've mentioned many times and you know and he's another example that you know, don't look at that and say that's what christianity is about now you know with with islam it's a little more complicated in that they've got some some of the writings in their in the Quran that call for violence, and their um, their founder Muhammad was a military leader, and used violence um, to get uh, Islam started. All right, but modern Muslims sort of look at that and and um, seem to sort of have the attitude: well, that was the way it was done back then. That's not the way we do it now. So, um, some. I, yeah. I mean, we've had the, you know, we'd have the, the riots over the, you know, the Danish cartoons and stuff. But, you know, when it comes to violence in the name of of, of, of God, you know, we have yet to beat the 30 years war. Uh, yeah. You know, I mean, um, so, I don't know. Now, I know, coming from Reformation Day, have you ever played the war game of Mighty Fortress? No. It actually exists. It's at the St. Louis Seminary. Uh, and a bunch of us stayed up to like four in the morning one time playing that game. Um, the Pope became Lutheran by treaty in order to save himself in our in our in our stuff. But yeah, it's based on the small call the cores. Huh, cool. It's like a really like an Axis and Allies kind of thing, or risk or something like that. The yeah. board game. Cool. Yep. Um that's, that's an interesting game. Okay. I mean my favorite was this guy, John Cosgrove. Who identified himself as a counterterrorism consultant, <laughs> and he says Thomas Jefferson possessed a copy of the Koran. He had it so he could know his enemy, so he could confront them, know them, kill them, and vanquish the Islamic pirates, discourage the seas, spreading tyranny abroad. After the reading of the Koran, founding the Marines, and expanding the Navy to kill them, I think he laid the Koran down, thinking perhaps he was done. Sadly, it was not the case. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I get out of Jefferson's writings. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So. <laughs> okay, well, at the same time they were praying, yeah, we, there were two pastors, black pastors, by the way, um, which I thought was interesting. Uh and uh, they were kneeling and praying outside the White House, and they were in a restricted area. Uh, they said uh, President Obama didn't come to the National Day of Prayer, so they're bringing the prayer to him. And um, they were uh, asked several times to please move and get out of the restricted area. They refused, and so they were three, three times. They were given three warnings. And then they are arrested and charged with failure to obey a lawful order. Yeah. So now the thing is, people are now jumping on this and saying, look, how come the Muslims can assemble but the Christians can't? All right? And they're turning this into a discrimination thing. Um, folks, these happen in two different places. All right, There are certain places around the White House and other places in Washington, D.C., for that matter, that nobody's allowed to assemble. All right. Now, if these guys had gone out, 
gotten, you know, if if they needed a permit or, or else assembled. Like I know that with the White House, and I sent an uh, email <laughs> to the White House. I was kind of hoping to hear back, but not really holding my breath to to find out because I tried to fig- I tried to find out where the restricted areas are and where they aren't, and I looked all over on the internet and I couldn't find anything. Um, I'm sure the information's out there somewhere, but you know, it, like with the White House. If you want to pick at the White House or, or have any sort of assembly, you just have to go across the street. There's a park right across the street. I haven't been there. Um, uh, some members of my family have. Um, and there, But there's a park across the street, and that's where the place, there's constantly um, different assemblies there and stuff like that, people picketing and, and whatnot. And, okay, you want to do your demonstration, you go over there. It's across the street, all right? You can't you can, certain... you can pick it right in front of you can pick it right in front of the White House. There's a big black fence there, and there's a sidewalk, and there's some ugly concrete barriers. And you can you can walk on that sidewalk. You can there's people there picketing all you know, it's holding up their signs, and there's people there with their you know, well, when I was there with George Bush, their cardboard cutouts, George Bush for you to go have your picture taken with him and stuff. Uh, that's all over there. Um, you know, plus across the street over there. <laughs> over in the ellipse across the street. Um, I mean, they're, they're, no, it's Lafayette Park. So it's Lafayette Park there, yeah, yeah. across the street. So and, I mean, you know, but this was a restricted area. This may be. Uh, I'm wondering a little bit if this, if they kind of, I don't know if they're doing the tours anymore. Still, uh, I, for when I last time I was there, they were they had closed down the tours at the White House. Uh, but I wonder if this might be. I won't get up. That might be open, and then they just start kneeling or something. I don't know. Um, but the Christians had, um, oh goodness, there was a, there was a famous Million Man March a few years ago, which wasn't hardly a million. And about think, six months later, there was a Christian gathering in Washington D.C., mm-hmm. which was probably about twice. I was told, you know, with half again as many people, um, but it just wasn't reported. Uh, there's. Uh, the LCMS took over the, the National Mall one time when the youth gathering was there in um, 86. Um, yep. I, I, was there there. A, I was there as a youth, youth count, uh, as, as a pastor uh, in, and had to take care of the, kid, the youth. Um, there was, uh, matter of fact, the LCMS took over the National, uh, uh, the uh, uh, Lincoln Memorial, too. That was really cool that night. Um, there, there was Washington for Jesus in 1976, I think it was. I mean, so there's been plenty of, of opportunities, 78, yeah, something like that. But there's been opportunities where, where, where Christians have done the same thing. Yeah. Uh, but you so, just don't do it restricted area. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, you know, what it comes down to is, you know, these guys were just, they were trying to claim discrimination, but it wasn't discrimination at all. Right. And, you know, and I'll tell you, this is, you know, you talk about, you know, embarrassed of, of our people, you know, I mean, that's, hello, you okay, you're supposed to obey the law, all right, unless the law goes, um, you know, if, if the law goes against your conscience, then you have to obey your conscience, okay, um, but you really, if you're going to break the law, you really need to, you know, to look at it and say, do I, you know, does my conscience really dictate that I break this particular law? You know, you know, and so most laws in the United States, um, because of the freedom of religion we have, uh, most laws don't really prohibit any sort of Christian um, religious practice, you know, except for if uh, someone has some sort of specific personal um, desire to do some feel a calling, you know, to, to something. Um, but as far as, you know, Christian doctrine kind of thing, there's, I, I know of no church and I certainly know of nowhere in the Bible that says that um, if you go to Washington DC to pray uh, and, and want to demonstrate and call the president to repentance or whatever your goal is, um, that you have to go to this one specific place that happens to be a restricted area. You know, how about instead you follow the law and show, you know, this is, this is what we're about instead of, you know, making a big stink and, and just really giving Christians a bad name. All Christians, they make trouble and, you know, and they're not, and, and they make trouble over stupid things like, where you can pray. 
Right. So sometimes I can make an excuse for you, uh, like an exception for you. We were coming back from uh, the youth gathering in San Antonio. We had two churches uh, from Massachusetts. We both drove down there following each other. And the kids wanted to have a closing communion service coming back. So uh, I said, okay, yeah, we can do that. So we got a bottle of wine. We got some, some pita bread. And uh, we went up to a state park. And uh, I went in, told them what we were going to do because they had big, you know, no alcohol. Mm-hmm. Now, number one, here we are, uh, uh, not only doing using alcohol in a camp we're not supposed to, but giving it to, to minors, too. To minors, yeah. And the guy said, he goes, look, you're, I know you're not drinking. You're using this sacramentally, and I understand that. He said, do me a favor. Just put the wine in the cup before you take a well for there. He said, just, I just don't want nobody, anybody to see it. Says, but I'll tell the other rangers that you're doing it, and you've got my okay. So, you know, I mean, so he was willing to bend the rules for us. Yeah, that's cool. Well, you know, I mean, yeah, that's great. And and you would have totally understood if he said, no, sorry, we got to, you know, go by the rules. Right. So. We would have followed it, but they, they made an excuse. Now, that's not the case at the Supreme Court in Illinois. Yep. Uh now, I don't know what to do with this one. I, I just, this was interesting to me. Um, so there's a, um, there's this, this Jewish couple. And their names were, uh, Erla, and his name was Max Feinberg. And, uh, they, uh, he was a dentist and a very good investor, and they became quite wealthy. And so they wrote, uh, their will. Um, was one thing, and then she changed it. But um, so uh, they set up these trusts for their grandchildren, and they said if any of them married a Gentile, that kid would not get a dime. Yeah. And, and the Illinois Supreme Court said they had every right to do it that way. Yeah. Which I, you know. As much as I think, wow, that's, you know, kind of racist and, you know, and, and stuff. Um, at the same time, and, and, you know, I understand there's a lot of, with the whole uh, Jewish culture that goes along with the, the Jewish religion and that, you know, there's, there's certainly plenty of things in the Old Testament that talk about not marrying people of other um other faiths and stuff like that. It kind of, um, it, I wonder if about, um, whether it would have mattered as, as far as how, how do you define Gentile? You know, if, if that person joined the Jewish faith afterward, would that be okay? You know, that would be okay. That, they, that specifically said that, that they had yeah. one year after they got married for the other person to convert to Judaism. Yeah. Um, but you know, I don't think there's anything racial here. I think it, this, this my, you know, this is our religion. It's very important to us, and we want our grandchildren to fully embrace it. I mean, uh, you know, I mean, I mean, do you, would you want your grandchildren to marry some Buddhist pagan? No. Nope. You know, so I mean, you know, so you're, you know, and I, I like it. Uh, Erla did not impose a, this to court. It, Erla did not impose a condition intended to control future decisions of their grandchildren regarding marriage or the practice of Judaism. Rather, she made a request to a reward at the time of her death those grandchildren whose lives most closely embraced the values she and Max cherished. Yep. Makes perfect sense to me. You know, and that is the problem that so many families have when it comes to um, inheritances. I mean, even Jesus ran into this where the guy comes to him and says, you know, Jesus, make him divide the inheritance properly and stuff. And Jesus says, hey, not my problem. Um, and uh, it's when you look at an inheritance, right? An inheritance is a gift, right? Mm-hmm. You don't deserve it. It's a gift. All right. The same goes with our inheritance in heaven, all right? We don't deserve it. It's a gift, you know, but a lot of people, that's, you know, that's why people think that, well, I've lived a good life. I've earned my way. Hmm. You can't earn an inheritance. 
So now the the, judge, the court wrote that said although these plans might be offensive to individually family members or to outside observers, Max and Erla were free to distribute their bounty as they saw fit and to favor grandchildren whose life choices they have <laughs> life choices they approve. Which, by the way, happened to be just one of them. <coughs> All the others, I think there's four totally. All the others had married non-Jewish people. Uh, so, uh, you know, and I, if you ask me, you know, I, and I have to, it was a unanimous decision, by the way, and I think the court was absolutely right. You know, it's their money. They can do with it what they want. Yeah. I mean, otherwise it's sort of like saying, well... Um, you know, I gave you a gift at your confirmation. I gave this one a gift at their confirmation. Oh, this one didn't get confirmed. You can't make me give them a gift, you know, just just because they happen to be that age or something. So, yeah, uh, one of their daughter granddaughters, Michelle Feinberg Troll, did uh, argued that the clause dubbed the beneficiary restriction clause by the court violated public policy by offering money to practice a particular religion. I don't – well, I, if the state does that, you've got a problem. Right. But if grandpa says you go to church and I'll pay you 100 bucks a week. Yeah, they have no say in that. <laughs> it's his money. You know, right. which, is, you know, which is exactly what they're basically saying. Yeah. You stay in Judaism, you, you, you stay Jewish, you marry a Jew. You know, you uh, uh, um, you know, you're, you know, you, you stay Jew, you marry a Jew, you stay Jewish, you get two hundred fifty thousand dollars. You don't marry a Jew, you don't get two hundred fifty thousand dollars. You make up your mind what you want to do. Yep. So yeah. So now I would hope that you know, and and obviously it was the case that um, money did not motivate these people' decisions who they were going to marry and and things like that. Um, so I, you know, I. I don't side with the um, the the grandchildren or, or whatever, but you know I'm I like that they didn't you know if I, I don't know whether they knew this or not. I'm assuming that they knew about it in advance, um, and I don't know maybe they just hoped that they could fight it after the fact or something. Um, and but you know if, if you're <laughs> if you're holding out. Are you gonna marry someone just so that you can get some money from somewhere? Boy, what a <laughs> that's just the wrong reason. So, you know, I'm glad. Well, yeah, they knew it because uh, one of the kids was dating a goy, uh, you know, a goy girl, and uh, uh, Grandpa told the told the, the kid. He said, "You do that, you'll be disinherited," and told him right then. You marry a goy, no money. You want a quarter million when I die. No goy. So, pretty easy. Yep. So, but I'm glad that I, 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 it's so often though courts, you know, uh, uh, will take other things and really take, I think, rights away from people to dispose of their property as they see fit. Mm -hmm. And I'm glad the court has uh, affirmed that right. Uh, especially considering when you consider that so many people don't believe in anything. There you go. It's kind of right. nice uh, to have people who really want to believe in their kids to believe in something, grandkids believe in something. Yep. So uh, we've got a story in the New York Daily News about a new study uh, that uh, more Americans are choosing to be nuns, uh, not N-U-N, but N-O-N-E, uh, mm -hmm. as in what's your religion? None. Now, when I first saw this, it's, it, okay, there's it was a little confusing because they use the word they said 15% of the nation doesn't associate with a religious denomination. Uh, yeah, I know lots of non-denominational Christians, you know. But um, the way that they mean it here is when they say denomination, they mean uh, a religion, an organized um, religion of some kind. And um, people tend to prefer disorganized religion, apparently. <laughs> because uh yeah they go through the the whole thing and they kind of nailed on some of the um stuff but they said a majority of of these nuns as they call them 59% claim to believe in some sort of higher power right so they 
believe in in God of some kind. They believe that there's more to um, to life than what we can perceive with our senses, uh, but they just don't um, they don't believe that it's any of the gods of um, of the various uh, organized religions. It's against my programming to impersonate a deity. Uh, the majority of them are youngest, uh, 18 to uh, 29, and that's almost 22% say that they have no religion at all. No surprise there. Uh, no, no, no surprise there. Uh, 68% said they had some sort of religious direction at age 12. 35% said they had once been Catholic. Um, <coughs> and, uh, you know... Again, that. But again, who are these? These, the, you know, the younger nuns. They're, they're eighteen, twenty-nine. That's my daughter's, my oldest daughter's generation. You know, um, a lot of her friends were, you know, when she was in high school, or were already walking away from church, uh, had no use for it, um, and were, you know, or getting getting at that point getting into witchcraft and other things, and then the new agey stuff. Um, you know, but their parents didn't have anything. You know, they, they, they might, you know, go to church at Christmas and Easter. You know, they were nominally Catholic or nominally, uh, um, whatever. Most of them, I think, were nominally Catholic. Um, but that's just it. Faith is more caught than it is taught. If, you know, you can send the kids to Sunday. I, I keep trying to tell these parents in my church, send the kids to Sunday school. If you don't go to church, if you're not involved, the kids aren't going to see any reason to be involved after a certain age. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, you know, so this is going to continue. Um, you know, they, they say in the article that they predict that a quarter of Americans will be without a religion in 20 years. And I mean, really, yeah, you've got that where the parents drop them off for Sunday school and then pick them up afterward and, and don't actually come to church. Um, it's not a topic of discussion at home, uh, except for, well, you're going, you know, and you get like this, oh, well, why? Because I had to go, so you're going to go, you know, so it's like a punishment. You you have to do this and, um, or, or well, because otherwise grandma won't get off my back, or, you know, or, or whatever, and it's like, it's like you're just gonna. This is a hoop that you have to jump through, um, which you know, of course, is is firmly embedded in the law um, instead of the gospel. And and so, yeah, it's you know, you're gonna see this. And you know, if I'm assuming that this uh, age bracket doesn't surprise anybody. I mean, look in your church, okay? Unless you're in one of those churches that specifically um, has that the entire church is, is focused on this particular generation, uh, which there are churches out there like that. Uh, chances are people in that uh, sort of 20 something age bracket, you're not going to have very many. And not unless again, they were raised with it. Now it's really interesting because I, we, one of our members, uh, I, uh, um, they have a daughter and they they raised their daughter in the church. And I mean, uh, um, this, these, these are great leaders in our congregation and stuff. And um, daughter um, kind of walked away from it when she was in college. Um, moved in with her boyfriend. Uh, they got married. Uh, had uh, first child, and it was about get get a year yet old yet. I don't know, but. You know, this, this, you know, she, daughter was sitting there going, I was raised with a faith, and I want my daughter to be raised with the same faith. And so she got a hold of us and uh, said, you know, where's, where's the closest church up there? And I said, oh, here, here's an awesome congregation for you. And so she started going up there in April, and they are every Sunday now involved in Sunday morning Bible study, involved in another Bible study, volunteered to be on their altar guild, and she's just like, I am so glad I'm back. Yeah. You know, well, that's the thing. Is, life. For so many people, they just get out of the habit, all right? Maybe it was it was um, grandma wanted to make sure that, or, or mom wanted to make sure that they got confirmed, and then 
after they were confirmed, it's like, I did my job, you know, and, and haven't really been back since. And, um, so then they sort of get out of the habit, you know, I mean, this is, okay. Is it, is it right to go to church just because it's habit? All right. Is it right to encourage like, okay, even if you don't know why you're going, still go just get in the habit. Right. I mean, and, and quite frankly, as, as much as I'd like to say, well, no, you really, um, should be going because you want to. All right. Jesus himself said the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Okay. You know, you, I, I've known plenty of people that have very good intentions and plan on going and Sunday morning rolls around and they're tired and they just go, nah. you know, well, you know, that's fine. If you have a hard time getting up, we've got a, you know, an evening service, uh, during the week that you can go to. Yeah. But you know, there's stuff going on during the week, you know, parents with, um, with kids in school, that's pretty tough, you know, for them to do that kind of thing. And so it just kind of falls by the wayside. And, uh, so, I mean, you get out of the habit and then it's either you realize, wait a minute, I want this for my kids. Um, and then you get involved again. And, and if you, you know, really dive in and yeah, usually the reaction is, Oh, I'm so glad you know, that I did this for other people. They've got to hit a crisis first. You know, something horrible happens. Uh, I have a friend of mine is a hospital chaplain. Um, and you know, he's had so many people that they've been laying in the hospital and, uh, he, you know, he goes and talks to him, explains the gospel to him and, and that, and, and, uh, you know, and, and he's had so many people tell him, I'm so glad I got sick. I'm so glad I got injured. Because otherwise, um, I would have never, uh, I would have never heard that message. I would have, ne- you know, and, um, so yeah, unfortunately, it's not like we want anybody to have a major crisis in their life. Um, but unfortunately for some people, that's what it takes, um, before, um, before they, it, they, their lives turn around, uh, just because we, um, we don't respond well to just good advice. Uh, sometimes it's like, yeah, you know what? You're not going to listen. So, uh, uh, we're going to have to notch this up a little bit to get your attention. You know, God did that to the Israelites, um, lots of times and, you know, well, that's fine. We'll send you into captivity until you, uh, wake up. And, you know, once you repent, we'll, uh, let you go again. And they went through that over and over again. So it's just, we don't learn. Of course, Dale really doesn't care if you believe or not. He doesn't care if you go to church or not. Just send money. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we haven't put the PayPal button on our uh, website yet. <laughs> so, you know, that's 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 what it comes down to. And... Um, <clears throat> So, you know, that's, that's, I am merciless to you, you know, I really yes, am. Yes, you but, are. Uh, <laughs> just like you think of it first, you, you, you don't. Um, anyway, so, basically, there's an article from the AP, which, you know, just says, basically, churches are hurting financially. Um, you know, uh, um. You know, it, with the recession on, it's just making a real stress in people's giving and everything else. Um, I know my congregation has felt it. You know, we're our preschool has more money in the bank right now than our our congregation does. Uh, you know, we're we're really struggling. Um, I I know the economy out there in Ohio is you know much worse shape than we are. Mm-hmm. Uh, imagine your congregation has been hurting it, taking it pretty tough too. You know, um, the, it seems like the biggest hit has been actually the preschool here. Uh, our enrollment is down, uh, especially the three-year-old classes because uh, people just can't afford to send their kids to both the, uh, to two years of preschool. And so they just send them to one. And, uh, so they wait until they're four. So that's, I mean, that's really hurt our preschool quite a bit. Uh, um, we, we got a pretty decent sized preschool, but it's, th- our numbers are way down this year. And, and, um, 
I mean, it's not, it's not because of the preschool. I, I, I mean, I, I went and got my hair cut, uh, last week and, um, guy found out that I was, that I was cutting my hair, found out that, uh, I was the pastor here and, and he, oh, my daughter goes to that preschool. Boy, we've heard nothing but good about, you know, that's got a really great reputation in the community and stuff. And, um, you know, really happy with it and stuff. And, and so, um, it's, it's not that we're doing anything wrong, you know, it's, it's just that people can't afford it. Right. Uh, a lot of, um, uh churches have shut down their schools um, and uh, they are religious organizations by the way this isn't just Christian churches this is Jewish synagogues and, and other things too um, but one guy said um, David Rusin lead researcher of faith communities today said uh, you know we're going to 2010 we're going to see 10 to 15 percent of congregations that's religious groups saying they're in serious financial trouble. Uh, I mean, already, I mean, in, in at least in our church body, um, you know, there are, there's a huge amount of churches that can't afford pastors. Mm -hmm. They can't afford to pay the pastor and his benefits and all those things. Right. Yeah. So um, coming up with, um, you know, we've had to come up with, and Jim actually teaches classes uh, for sort of alternate routes to pastors, um, that don't necessarily follow uh, the traditional uh, sort of seminary education, going out full time service and, and stuff like that. So, um, yeah, it's you know they have to adapt. So they're actually saying that uh, 2009 to 10 will make or break a year, will be a make or break year for Jewish education, partly because of the additional damage to endowments. And donors from Bernie Madoff's fraud. So he's, you know, you he, he just, he, it's just a tremendous, just that thing alone makes a huge difference. But there is one other thing. And that is the fact that we have not done a good job, really, of, you know, Christian churches in general, and I'm going to speak particularly of Lutheran churches for a minute, of teaching your people stewardship. Mm -hmm. You know, and we haven't really challenged them. And I can say that one of the reasons I never challenged my people in stewardship was because my own was so cruddy. And I couldn't challenge my people and be hypocritical. So I had to get my own giving in, 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 in order. And um, a friend of mine gave me a, a 10 for 10 challenge. He said, he challenged me to tithe for 10 weeks. He said, if you cannot live without that money, then cut back. And so for 10 weeks, try tithing. And my son was uh, going to a, a Christian high school, and uh, in car insurance up here is extremely expensive, and I just sat there and I said, there is just no way I can possibly do this. We did it. And that was three years ago, three and a half years ago, and we haven't stopped since. And uh, so, you know, I'm going to throw that, you know, encourage, it, it, seriously, if, if we could teach our people to tithe, we wouldn't have a financial problem in our churches. Yeah. you got to do it, right? people can do it. They, you can't. They, they think they can't. But you can't. Now, I've seen some churches where... You actually have to turn in your uh, your your tax return to your pastor, yep. right? And where and and if you're not, you get a visit, right. right? You can't do it that way. No, no, no. God loves a cheerful giver. Yep. Yeah. You, you know. Dictate. Um, I mean, I I preached on Ananias and Sapphira. Uh, you know that they you know they made a pledge to God that they could they didn't keep. Um, and you know, God doesn't want to. God doesn't want us to give because we feel guilty, or because we, feel, you know. But you know, I think a lot of people though, giving and tithing really shows trust, because you have to believe God's going to take care of you then. Uh, and I think for a lot of our people, it's really it's a matter more of faith. 
and then greed. I think it's just they just don't think they can do it. And I, I got people in my church. I know I need to sit down. I could challenge them to give more. Uh, so um, now, uh, uh, accept that as a challenge, everybody, uh, to to really consider what you're doing and you're, you're giving, and to. Uh, um, really put it out there, and I really uh, to the listeners, I'm going to give this 10 for 10 challenge. Uh, it, and I have found such a joy in giving, and the funny thing is, is, since we've been doing this, we look for more opportunities to give. My wife yeah. and I are always looking for things, places where we can do things we can do for the congregation, or other places that we can give, knowing that God's going to take care of us. Good on you, mate! That's cool. So, so uh, you know, you don't have a lot of white elephant gifts then. Sorry, I'm, no. I'm, I'm struggling no. here for a transition. <laughs> We've got this is up in yeah, Canada. No. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> um, uh, in the the Calgary Zoo, uh, up in Canada, and uh, they have a statue up there near the elephants of Ganesh, the um, Hindu elephant god, um, and. Uh, he, there's a group called the Concerned Christians Canada, um, who, I mean, this thing's been there for a couple of years, and now all of a sudden uh, they're complaining about it. That apparently nobody noticed it before or or didn't do anything about it, but now they're complaining, um, and they're saying, this is not appropriate at a public zoo to have a, uh, a zoo is not a place of religious expression. Whether you're a believer in any faith or, or an atheist or agnostic, if you're non-Hindu, it's a god that does not re- represent your views. Um, but the zoo has said, well, you know, it's the point wasn't religion or trying to, you know, promote a particular religion. The point is that it's a cultural symbol. It shows the tie between the elephants and the Asian culture. The Asian cultures, you know. Um, elephants are, are closely tied with that. And, and so, uh, it was just a, a way that we wanted to show how animals are, um, are, are tied into, to culture. It's, it's a cultural symbol, um, which, you know, of course in, uh, in that particular, uh, part the sort of heavenly Hindu, um, areas, uh, like India, for instance, um, you, Hinduism and the culture, you know, they go hand in hand. It's like Judaism, same thing. Um, you know, for that matter, uh, Irish Catholics, you know, I mean, there's just, that's often a, a particular um, a culture is going to have a particular religion connected to it, and you can't separate the two. Uh, and um, so, but they did say, that um, this was uh, an anonymous donor supplied the funds for it in memory of her late father who worked and traveled extensively in Asia. And um, they, the artist that created the statue was also asked to strip certain religious symbols associated with the god. All right, so it's a, it's a kind of a stripped-down version of it. So basically it's just sort of a walking elephant dressed in, you know, Indian garb. Right. They said it's certainly important to Hindu religion, but it's also very much a cultural symbol, and that was the intent here. Um, you know, I, I think to me kind of similar. I think it was Las Cruces, uh, California, and um, one of the uh, on, on their uh, the town seal, they had three crosses. And it was to, you know, remind the people that it was the town was originally started as a mission. And uh, the American Separation for Church and State, or ACLU, one of the groups sued, because how dare you have religious expression on your town seal? Of course, I wondered if they knew what La Crucis meant. Yeah, I know. But, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. If you're going to make them change the name of the town? <laughs> Well, it is a visual but, representation of the name of the town. <laughs> right. But, I mean, for them, in this case, the cross was more cultural and historic than it was religious. And I would say it's the same thing here with the dancing elephant. It's more cultural and, and um, you know, artsy there uh, than it is religious. It's not, you know, kind of like the totem pole. You know, I mean, there's areas where, you know, 
I can't remember when I even how old I was when I even found out that totem poles had a religious significance. <laughs> you know, yeah. I just thought they were the you know funky statues. Yeah, yeah. There's you know, and there's a lot of that. I yeah, they're they're saying well, um, they should be willing to incorporate other religious displays um, and see if they'll put up a Noah's Ark or you know some artifacts or some from some other faiths or something like that. And, um, you know, I, I could see that it, being completely appropriate too. If it, if it fits in, you know, uh, with the animal, I would say, you know, a dancing elephant, you know, uh, with, next to the elephant thing, um, next to Asian elephants. Uh, yeah, you can make that connection. Um, I don't know how honest they want to be with the Noah's Ark because of the people drowning there. Um, uh, you know, I don't, I don't know if they want to have the people all like dying. Um, I was thinking you could have a, a, an artifact. a wolf lie down with a lamb. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's maybe. I, I don't of course, know. Most people, I mean, without uh, like some kind of without like a, a scripture reference with it, <laughs> would just be like, "Does that wolf look hungry to you?" You know. <laughs> Or wolf in sheep's clothing, or you know, <laughs> maybe they get a you know a picture of John Lennon and John Lennon and Paul McCartney next to the walrus, you know, <laughs> exhibit, you know, and <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I mean, you know, they're, they're, they're religious figures, you know, depending, you know, some people anyway. Um, but I would say seriously, it has to somehow tie into the exhibit. Yeah. So I, you know, you know as long as a, as a cultural kind of thing, you know, I don't have a problem with it. If, you know, I, I, I do, th- you know, and here's the other thing. All right. If they say, well, you know, we'd like to donate a, um, a, a Noah's Ark or, you know, kind of thing or something like that. Um, okay, fine. But you'd have to kind of look at the zoo and, and the layout and stuff and say, is this going to fit, you know, with the, it, it is it going to stick out? Is it going to is it going to cause a problem? Are they going to have to close off sidewalks, you know, or or something? Um, you know, there's a lot of things to to take into account, you know, when you add something like that. So mm-hmm. it would depend on what it is, and and you, you know, you'd have to look at is this? Because, I mean, because honestly, most people when they see a dancing elephant, okay, they're not going to all of a sudden feel like someone's pushing Hinduism on them. You know, they've, they've seen the symbols and it, like when you see, um, th- this sort of, uh, these, these where, where they show, uh, who is it fish? I forget which, which of the Hindu gods with the like six arms, you know, and, um, and, and you see that and, and people go, oh, that's just like an India thing. You know, yeah, they've got one of their gods had six arms or something like that. And, but, you know, nobody, it's sort of like if you put up a, um, if, if there was a, a, a weather museum or something like that and there was a statue of Zeus there, you know, it's not, I mean, in that case, well, that's a, you know, that's a dead religion. But no, there's, there's still people that, you know, that believe in that. Um, so, it's yeah. It it really comes down to to context, but it just goes to show I, that there you can't separate religion and culture. Right. Well, I I don't think most people would, I think you agree. Most people see it as an India thing. Um, you know, I mean, other than the people who get hyper offended, like the ACLU, for a lot of people, the cross has been emptied of religious meaning. Hmm. I mean, I, you know, I, I've seen people you know wear them, you know, and. You know, as the famous one said, this woman goes went into a jewelry store and said, "We're looking for a cross for her son. Oh, do you want a bear one, or do you want one with a little man on it?" Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right over. Hey, but you know, these people. I I warned you last week. Don't mess with anonymous <laughs> Dale. <laughs> Well, thankfully, it wasn't nearly as bad as I was worried about. Ohio, um, remember that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, so um, so we didn't. I was really worried that we were gonna get a DDoS attack on our site. Um, that didn't happen. Um, as far as I know. 
Uh, if it did, our uh, service provider is real good about bringing it back up. Um, but the uh, we did get a comment on YouTube, um, <laughs> and it really left me wishing that we could get some more intelligent people on YouTube commenting. <laughs> I'm sorry, but um, you know, it's it, Jesus died for everybody, okay? But um, you know, if you're gonna open your mouth, have something worthwhile to say. Uh, it says. Your facts about Anonymous is so misinformed. I guess since you are a pastor, you must think your words are gold. Do your research on the decades of the highest ranking directors of Scientology. And this person, apparently their um, caps lock button stuck for parts of this too. Um, you're a real rocket scientist. Read Lisa McPherson's obituary and see what Scientology did for her and many more deceased Scientologists. You have no clue on the horrors of Scientology. So I'm I'm reading this. Okay. I, I've I've read this this thing over and over, trying to figure out what this guy's talking about. All right, because he's saying, "Oh well, you know, Scientology is so horrible and everything." We never said anything good about it. I'm pretty sure. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm, I, we said that the um that the anonymous people. I think I recall, and I haven't gone back to watch the episode, but I think I recall saying that, you know, in in some degree, a lot of people see them as heroes. Um, but the problem is, is that while you may agree with uh, with what Anonymous is, you know, sort of their intent um, to put down Scientology, um, there's, you know, you have to look at what their personalities are like the rest of the time and, you know, and stuff like that. So we don't need to rehash through all that again. But, um, so I'm, I, I don't really understand it. And this also struck me, this, this line, um, I think since you're a pastor, you must think your words are gold. Now, every once in a while, we'll say something like, you know, what we say on this show is a lot different from um, what we preach in the pulpit as far as on this show we give our personal opinions, which are valuable. And that episode was one of them where we did that. And we don't do that all that often. So it's just sort of ironic to say, well, you think that your words are gold. When I'm in the pulpit and I'm speaking the word of God, yes, absolutely. You know, um, but not on this show. Not, you know, if when I'm, when I'm, Proclaiming the gospel, you know, in connection with the story, yeah, okay. Uh, as far as you know, my opinions of of uh, various Scientologists or um, or uh, or this anonymous group, or you know, or whatever, nah, that's just my opinion, you know. And you have absolutely, and it, it, we always tell people oh, disagree with us, you know, by all means, send us a note and disagree with us. So he disagreed with us, but he actually agreed with us. <laughs> Everything he said is in agreement with with what we've said so um i you know someone on youtube if you're watching this leave a coherent intelligent comment we will read it on the show and we will thank you profusely for it <laughs> every once in a while we get one <laughs> but not all that often <laughs> and youtube especially right. um uh, by the way uh 2009 together he did us um, I uh, used to actually head up a group that uh, it worked on evangelizing cults uh, when I was in seminary, and uh, I spent a lot of time working, uh, uh, doing cult research and, and things like that. And yes, you're you know absolutely right. Um, you know, Scientology is really a very evil religion. Um, so be surprised they don't sue me for saying that. Um, because they, 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 they were known for suing anything that walked that said a negative word about them. And, uh, and I do know others who have, you know, uh, been hurt very much coming out of that and hurt while they were in it. And, uh, you know, you're right about that. But, you know, from what Dale said about the anonymous group, that, you know, they're not necessarily very nice people, you know, outside of what they're doing to Scientologists. You know, just kind of, you know, two wrongs don't necessarily make a right. Right. And so I think two rights make a left. Yeah. Three rights make a left. Three rights make a left. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I mean, the other thing is a lot of the stuff the anonymous group is doing is illegal. You know, that's why I was a little concerned about 
being, you know, the subject of a DDoS attack or, or somebody hacking our site. Um, you know, I, I kept going through my head. Okay. Now, how often is the site set to automatically back up? Um, let's see. When's the last time it ran? <laughs> you know, is it back up to the same server? Yeah. Oh, I hope they don't hack the backup, you know? <laughs> so, cause yeah, these, you know, laws. <laughs> um, so I, I'm glad so far that we haven't gotten their attention. So. Um, but yeah, we'd, we'd love to hear from anybody out there. I know, uh, quite a few people on break.com, uh, watch us and, and blip.tv and a few other places. If you're watching us there, drop us a note, you know, even just leave a message and say, I like this show or I don't like this show or, uh, we've gotten a lot of you guys are lame, um, you know, and stuff like that. So, uh, you know, tell us what you think or go to, go to the iTunes. This is what we really love is if you go to the iTunes, uh, direct podcast directory and leave a comment there uh, that lets people know that there's actually people watching and listening. It, you know, doesn't really explain why, but, uh, you know, <laughs> um, or it, 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 it may be a, maybe people aren't doing it because they don't want to be associated with it. I don't know. But, uh, yeah, we, we'd love to hear from you. It's, you know, it's one of our favorite things about the show is hearing from um, from different people and and uh, getting their feedback and stuff like that. That's just really cool. So mm -hmm. it is, and hopefully you might have some feedback, which you can always send us at podcast at crossfeednews dot com, or you can you know comment on YouTube or any other place you see this. Uh, Dale and I always always welcome your comments and your feedback. Mm -hmm. And uh, we pray, then, that God would be with you this week and always with you in his grace. Uh, for we do have a very loving and gracious God who has given us his son. Yeah, absolutely. And that's not opinion. Um, and, oh, and next week... That is gold. Yeah, that's right. That's gold. Uh, next week, speaking of gold, uh, Fake Jim is going to be on again. Um, Joe Burnham, <laughs> <laughs> who's... Who has uh, filled in uh, in the past when Jim wasn't able to make it? Uh, Jim's going to be on vacation, and so uh, Joe has agreed to fill in again. Now I'll tell you though, um, I am, I'm looking forward to it. Joe's a good friend, and he's a really neat guy. Um, at the same time, he's in Denver, and you know it used to, be, and and he has to record a little bit later after he gets kids to bed and, and stuff like that. And uh, you know it's already nine o'clock when we start recording. And, and Jim and I are in the same time zone. And it used to be eight o'clock for me, which was really kind of nice. Um, but I'm going to be up super late that night <laughs> um, to to meet with with Joe's schedule. So um, you, you might want to watch that episode because I have no idea what I'm going to be like. <laughs> I think we're going to probably end up starting about ten, eleven o'clock at night. So. Mm -hmm. As it just so happened, I uh, actually will be out in Denver, uh, but on Thursday night we will be in the middle of Nowhereville, Missouri, and uh, so there's, they, I don't think they've even heard there is such things as the internet, let alone have a hookup to it, so <laughs> um, we're going to be in Rayville, population 83, so, but uh, folks, I'll see you when I get back. God bless. <laughs> All right, good night, everybody. God bless.